Studio 1 in Berlin. Dort, wo Knowledge auf Entertainment trifft. Wo sich Kulturgrößen und Szenekenner über den heißesten Scheiß austauschen. Größer als der Hype. Realer als die Realität. Genau dort steht auch ein kleines Studio 2. Und von hier kommt die neue Ausgabe von Oh Schuhen, der Sneaker-Podcast mit Simon Buß und Amadeus Thüner. Müssen wir eigentlich mal eine neue Intro-Musik machen? Nö, ne? Eigentlich nicht, oder? Ich finde die immer noch super. Ich mag die noch. Ich kann die, ich kann die mit, mit, mittrommeln. Ist auch schöner, als die mitzusummen, Simon. Ich sag's dir das ganz ist fast so, ich, ich, ich glaube, das wird irgendwann so ein, so ein neues, also oder das zweite in the air tonight. Okay, jetzt nimmst du den Mund sehr voll. Aber solange Phil Collins das nicht hört. Ist richtig. Und damit hallo und herzlich willkommen zur 55. <lacht> Episode des Oh Schuhen Sneaker Podcast. Eine erneute Schnapsepisode, die 55. Und äh, wir haben uns wieder was ganz Besonderes ausgedacht, wie glaube ich in allen Schnapsepisoden davor schon. Als, als wären die anderen Episoden dazwischen jetzt nichts Besonderes. Sorry, da mache ich uns schlechter, als wir eigentlich sind. Ne? Aber ich wollte gerade sagen, was war das denn jetzt gerade? <lacht> was, was, was soll das denn bitte? Was ich sage jetzt eine Marketingform, die ich hier noch nicht kenne. Was ist da denn hier gebacken, hör mal. Mensch, Maya. Ja, äh, hallo und herzlich willkommen, Amadeus. Äh, wie ist es dir? Äh, soweit ganz gut. Wie geht's dir? Ich kann nicht klagen. Ja, schön. Mensch, Dann ich, äh... gehen wir doch mal direkt ins Feedback der letzten Episode. <lacht> Dann tschüss, ne? <lacht> nee, möchtest du der Welt noch irgendwas, ja, haben uns alles gesagt. Du der Welt noch irgendwas mitteilen? Kannst du gerne. An dieser Stelle kannst du grüßen, wenn du möchtest. Oder vielleicht auch. Kannst, oh, doch, doch. Eine Sache, eine Sache müssen wir äh, doch nochmal aufrufen. Und zwar, wie sieht es denn zur 55. Episode eigentlich mit dem aktuellen Stand deines Ausmistens aus? Oh ja, äh, es ist jetzt nicht sehr viel weitergekommen. Ich war letztes Wochenende nochmal im Keller tatsächlich. Ich habe mir den Bums nochmal angeguckt und habe dann aber auch relativ schnell wieder abgedreht und äh, mir ein Stück Kuchen besorgt und Kaffee gekocht. Muss ja auch mal sein. <lacht> ich hab, also so viel, Prinzip, ist, ich bin, so viel ist noch nicht passiert, sagst du? Nee, ich bin runter bei 65 nach wie vor ungefähr, okay. äh, müsste unten nochmal fünf Paare aus dem einen Regal rausziehen, bei denen ich glaube, dass ich sie doch behalten möchte und äh, müsste mich dann langsamer darum kümmern, mir zu überlegen, wie ich sie loswerden möchte, haben wir in der letzten Episode schon gesagt, eventuell äh, fahren der Ammer und der Erol und wer auch immer noch Bock hat mitzukommen auf eine Sneakermesse, machen einen schönen Tisch, kleinen Plausch, wird ein lecker Nachmittag, ähm, <lacht> vielleicht mache ich ein paar Leuten noch eine kleine Freude mit einem Paar, das muss ich mal sehen, aber das wird eh noch ein bisschen dauern, okay. ich hatte ja auch in der Episode schon angekündigt, kündigt, dass ich, keine Ahnung, erstmal noch zwei, drei Monate warte und das Ganze sacken lasse, aber äh, ansonsten hat sich nichts verändert. Okay, gut, sind wir da weiterhin gespannt und kommen, wie gesagt, zur, zum Feedback der äh, Episode hm. 54. Es war ein großes Q&A, wir haben viele verschiedene Fragen beantwortet, unter anderem auch zum Thema Preisschmerzgrenze und da hat Yogi Hollick via Instagram geschrieben, 520 Euro von StockX für den Union Black Toe im Dezember 2018 bezahlt hm. und wenn man sich das heute mal anguckt, ist das auf jeden Fall ein ziemlicher Schnapper. Aber trotzdem 520 Euro. Und genau das ist auch, wo das meiste Feedback herkam. Leute, die gesagt haben so, hey, 520 Euro ist eine Stange Geld und eigentlich auch mehr, als ich eigentlich bereit bin auszugeben. Aber wenn dann der richtige Schuh um die Ecke kommt, bei dem man natürlich absehen kann, dass dieser Preis irgendwann das Doppelte sein wird, so dann ist es ja irgendwo wieder ein Schnapper. Es ist so mein Gefühl von dem, was wir an Feedback bekommen haben, durchaus bei vielen Leuten starker Kampf. Also die <lacht> Die wenigsten haben wirklich geschrieben, so ja 120 Euro, das ist die Grenze, mehr geht nicht, Resale zahle ich auf keinen Fall. <lacht> Äh, auch die Kommentare gab es aber eigentlich eher weniger. Also es ist häufig dieses so, ja, ich muss das von Schuh zu Schuh entscheiden. Ja, aber verständlicherweise. Geht mir ehrlich gesagt nicht anders. Henry.stx schrieb zum Thema Dankhype. Das war ja auch eine Frage, was halten wir vom Dankhype, dem aktuellen? Er schreibt, also ich finde den Hype berechtigt, jedoch ein bisschen blöd, wenn die, Zitat, Hyperbiester, Zitat Ende, sich einen Dank kaufen, ohne irgendeine Ahnung von der Story dahinter zu haben. Zum Thema Aufbewahrung haben wir von Kicks-Mann noch die, äh, das Feedback bekommen, Schuhkartons aus Platzgründen, ja, wobei acht bis neun Paar immer frische Luft erhalten und als eine Art Deko im Zimmer stehen. Nach dem Tragen werden sie aber immer direkt gereinigt, bevor sie in die Kartons zurückkehren. Das ist eigentlich auch eine ganz gute Idee, weil wenn man sie sonst wieder aus dem Karton rausholt und sie dreckig sind, das ist, das ist ja nur traurig. Also von daher, das ist vollkommen verständlich. Ja, so das Feedback ja, der kann ich Episode. Wer sich da jetzt berufen fühlt, irgendetwas zu, zu sagen im Sinne von so, oh, sehe jetzt aber ganz anders und oh, 580 Euro von Union Black Toe, da muss ich mal direkt in die DMs leiden. Tue dies gerne bei Instagram. Das ähm, ist äh, dort natürlich gern gesehen. Ne? Das ist ja die Plattform zum Unterhalten. Da kann man sich austauschen, kann Freundschaften knüpfen und, und derlei Dinge. Ne? Simon, 
<lacht> Für die 55. Episode haben wir uns, das habe ich eingangs schon gesagt, was Besonderes ausgedacht. Wir haben ein kleines Advertorial an Land gezogen und mit StockX gesprochen, die ähm, direkt auch Bock hatten, hier was mit uns zu machen. Und da haben der Amadeus und ich gesagt, so Mensch Meier, wieso denn eigentlich nicht? Da lassen wir uns nicht lumpen und äh, haben da auch jemand ganz tollen für gewinnen können, nämlich den... CEO bzw. den Director of StockX in Europe. Das ist äh, Derek Morrison, mit dem kommen wir gleich ins Gespräch. Vorher müssen wir aber natürlich noch eine Sache machen, die wir hier immer machen. Und äh, mein lieber Amadeus, das dürfen wir nicht einreißen lassen, dass wir das vergessen. Deshalb jetzt noch, was tragen wir eigentlich am Fuß? What's on my feet today? Ich habe äh, ein bisschen den inneren Steve Jobs kanalisiert und New Balance 992 GR am Fuß. Oh, das und du, mein Lieber? Das ist ja echt langweilig bei dir, das muss man an dieser Stelle wirklich Sorry. einfach mal sagen. Also, das, also so gern ich äh, New Balance ja mag, alle 99er und auch dich in diesen grauen Schuhen. Also dieser Running Gag ist ja echt irgendwann auserzählt. Ich möchte, das ist die kleine Hausaufgabe, die ich dir an dieser Stelle aufgeben möchte. Ich möchte nächste Episode von dir etwas ganz Außergewöhnliches hören. Tust okay, du mir diesen Gefallen? Du. Ich bin sehr 56. gespannt. 56. kriegst du. Okay, da bin ich sehr gespannt. Ich meine, du bist ja eh dabei, die ganzen Sachen auszusortieren, hier und da zu gucken. Also von daher, du müsstest ja mittlerweile einen ziemlich guten Überblick haben von dem, was halt bei dir noch im Schrank steht. Also da bin ich jetzt sehr gespannt. Das bekommst du auf jeden Fall. Was hast du am Fuß? Okay. Ich trage den Jordan 5 Fire Red. Mit einem lieben Gruß an die Jungs von The Few. Ein wunderbarer Schuh. Ich bin sehr froh, dass er wieder da ist. Auch näher an einen OG kann ein Retro heutzutage, glaube ich, nicht rankommen. Das Ding ist wirklich eine Wucht, natürlich halt. Und das hatten wir in der letzten Episode auch. Ein klobiges Modell, was man sicherlich bei über 20 Grad nicht wirklich an den Fuß ziehen kann. Aber jetzt hier gerade ist das Wetter jetzt nicht so schön, muss ich zugeben. Also von daher passt das sehr gut. Abseits davon, dass ich mich eigentlich eh nur im Haus aufhalte und den am Fuß habe. Ich wollte gerade sagen, weil ich aber diesen, diesen Wetteraspekt, den brauchst Du jetzt nicht Ein, noch eigentlich nicht, ne? zu nutzen. Aber fand ich eigentlich einen ganz guten Punkt. Nee, aber eigentlich habe ich, ich kann einfach nur nicht mehr meine Nike-Lette sehen und eine Adilette und eine Lette oder was auch immer. Also ich, ich brauche halt mal zwischendurch echt irgendwie was am Fuß, was so aussieht. Naja. Und nachdem wir beide jetzt gesagt haben, was wir am Fuß tragen, kommen wir also zu unserem Gast, den Director von StockX Europe, Derek Morrison. Derek, first things first, what's on your feet today? I don't I'm not wearing any shoes right now. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, really? I'm indoors. I'm in quarantine. You know, I, I think the cool answer would be that I have some Yeezy slides on or something like that, just to be like, <laughs> yeah, I'm right in the moment. But that's, that's just not the truth. I mean, <laughs> look, I'm a, I think I've always considered myself a Nike guy for my entire life, right? But I mean, just this kind of how a lot of us get into sneakers. Um, mm -hmm. I was, I've, I, my, my sneaker habits are really kind of across the spectrum. But um, it's not like the cool sneakerhead thing to say. But I wear Yeezy 350s more than any other shoe because they're just so comfy. And I'm <laughs> and I'm an old man now. I'm a dad. And so if I, when I'm leaving the house, I'm just looking for the comfiest pair of shoes. So if I was wearing a pair of shoes indoors right now, they'd probably be they probably have a boost sole on it. Um, okay. But uh, that's not that's not that's not just my rotation. So I'm sure we'll get to dive into <laughs> like more of my sneaker trends and sneaker habits. <laughs> we'll do that. We'll do that in a second. Um, people often say that you are the reason why we Europeans are even able to use StockX, which makes you kind of the good to go guy for us. But um, please do our listeners the favor and introduce yourself. Um, yeah, I mean, for better or for worse, right? I guess um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a quite a reputation to have. Yeah. So, um, you know, my name is Derek Morrison. I'm the senior director of Europe for StockX. Um, I was uh, the great honor. I was the first person outside of USA employed by StockX. So, um, look, I've been a sneakerhead all my life. Um, we can talk about pumps. We can talk about SPs. We, and I'm looking forward to talking about all of my history of sneaker fanaticism. As you can tell by my accent, I'm not from the UK. I'm not from Europe. I'm actually from Canada originally. Um, and so being from the middle of nowhere in Canada, I was always kind of dependent on the resale world to get the shoes that I wanted, whether it was European releases from Soulbox back in the day or from stuff from Colette or, you know, trying to find connections in Japan. So the resale world was always the only way I could get the things that I wanted. And so when I discovered StockX um, and Campless before that, um, I was always really keen because when I heard Josh Luber's TED talk on the sneaker resale world, it was the kind of validation and vindication. Um, you know, it was, TED, it was a peak TED talks time. I sent it to all my family that would kind of 
harassed me for <laughs> and um, ridiculed me for my sneaker um, addiction and said, this guy is talking what I've been telling you all these years. And it's on TED now. So it's, you know, it's not just me saying it, why I'm insuring my sneaker collection. <laughs> and so after that, I was, you know, kind of followed them. And um, I moved to Europe in 2011. Um, I lived in Italy before I came to, to London. I, I worked in the wine industry for a long time. And, um, um, you know, I just started when StockX came about, I it being based in the UK, I said, man, what a great opportunity. Uh, what a great platform. What a great business model. Um, why is this not optimized for Europe? They should really, really launch this here. Um, and so my background, other than being a sneakerhead, is, is um, you know, I, I studied economics. Beyond sneakers, I've always been obsessed with how people buy and sell things in the marketplace and and um, how um, how people make their consumer decisions and how we optimize outcomes in, in marketplaces. So StockX was kind of a perfect blend of my nerdy obsessions in terms of economics and marketplace dynamics and consumer behavior and also sneakers, something I've been passionate about my entire life. So I was I just got it. The whole model made sense to me. I understood why it was such an efficient way of trading sneakers um, and how it was so much more improved on all the ways I had been up to that point buying shoes. Um, and so I had reached out to them and just said, Hey, you know, I'm a really big fan of the platform. I'm a really big fan of what you do. And I totally get it. Um, if they're, if you're looking at the opportunity in Europe in any way, let me know how I can help. And, and, um, I'd be really keen a, because as a buyer or a user, it coming to the marketplace would benefit me to use the platform better, let alone, um, to be able to be kind of the first leader brought on internationally to help uh, bring it to life in Europe. So that's a bit of the context and backstory to it, but it's, it doesn't take, you know, I think a lot of us probably had the same idea when we discovered StockX. I probably just um, was lucky to be uh, earlier on in that conversation. So you, you said you moved to Europe to work in the wine and champagne business. And then you, you, uh, you moved over to StockX. Just one question from a wine fanatic to another. <laughs> <laughs> What made you move? <laughs> what made me move from one? Well, you know, I, that's a good question. I, I, um, I mean, I tell you what, if you go on my Instagram, you look at what I drank last night. I mean, we, we, we <laughs> still have, um, you know, we still have plenty of, plenty of wine. So that, that doesn't leave you. Just as when I was working in the wine industry, I was still buying sneakers. So it's, um, you know, I think there's a lot more, more in common than, than they have. The secondary market for wine behaves the exact same way as the secondary market for sneakers. So, um, for me, I guess in my life, I've always just tried to engage with things that are about who I am and, um, and I've been really fortunate to work in two of my most passionate areas. And so, um, um, yeah, I guess it, it seems probably more like a departure to most than, than others, but, uh, You know, my cell my seller is still got the same stuff. I'm just the wine guy at the sneaker in the sneaker space as opposed to the sneaker guy at the wine space. <laughs> Great answer. So um, I know you travel a lot, not only since you started at StockX. Um, you've been to Berlin for an event with Soulbox, and I guess you met Amadeus there for the first time, right? Yeah, yeah. And you've you've been to Sneakerness for Cologne re, uh, in Cologne, and. Um, You've had a few glimpses into the German sneaker scene. What do you think about it? What, what, are there anything that, that, that differences or makes them kind of special uh, in comparison to other sneaker scenes? Yeah, I guess, um, I mean, a lot, right? You know, I think um, there's a lot of obvious things we can talk about, but, um, you know, Adidas and Puma's heritage in, in, in the country, I think, is a really big part of how Germany's always had its own identity in terms of sneaker culture. Um, you know, growing up in Canada, I was a massive fan of Soulbox, you know, massive fan of Hikmet and, you know, some of my all time grails that I even talked about with him were, you know, being a Reeboks pump guy, the Soulbox pumps uh, that they did, the Omnilites, and then the, the 20th anniversary pumps that came out with, like, we're all friends and family releases in 2009. There was Soulbox did a pair, um, I think Undefeated did a pair, Colette did a pair. And, you know, those are some of my ultimate grails that I, I look I look for all the time. Um, so even before I came to Europe, I was greatly influenced by, you know, some of the the, the sneaker culture coming out of there. Um, but what I think, you know, in, in recent years that I've always really appreciated of Germany is it's it's um, the, the heritage, but also just the um, strength of going its own way. You know, I think whether it's, um, you know. Um, you know, even West and East Berlin have different sneaker histories, right? And you know, I think that's just really cool. It's such a rich country in terms of stories, history that informs tastes now. But if I want to think more general, like 
I just love the run the the support for runner culture in Germany. Whether it's kind of um, whether we're talking about Asics or we're talking about um, you know, I'm a big Diodora guy as well. And so when I go around to sneaker conventions, I'm always looking for just random obscure stuff that um, you know aren't hype. And so you find a lot of just great collectors that that have kind of kept that going on. And you see that with lots of different models that resell at massive premiums um, on our platform that um, you get, are you know. Whether it's like an FU, um, you know, um, Asics that are they're reselling, or some of the old Soulbox Diodoras, or um, whatever the different models may be, I think you you see a lot of history and and um, unique unique tastes. So it's I wouldn't think of mar- every market enjoys the hype products, but when I think of German sneaker culture, I don't immediately think of. Um, um, I don't immediately think of hype products as the defining taste. I think of a lot more heritage. A lot. I think a lot more about runners. I think a lot more about Hikmet and what his influence has been, and and everyone else around him. You know, I think um, um, the boutiques in Germany have really done some of my favorite products over the years, and and um, you see that in terms of their resale and resonance now. You already mentioned Reebok and Diadora, but was that the first sneaker brand who got you into the whole sneaker game? Or what was the, or to make it specific, more specific, what was the first sneaker who got you into the game? Yeah, good question. So um, the first sneaker, so I played basketball growing up like a lot mm-hmm. of us did. Um, I, I, I don't think my parents said it to me, but what, the way I heard it was like, look, you're not good enough that we're going to spend 300 Canadian dollars on a pair of Jordans where you can, you, <laughs> okay. you, you can, you know, they... Um, oh, you know, so I, I, so I, I was when I played basketball, I was wearing and one Tai Chi's, um, mm-hmm. which and uh, being Canadian, a Vince Carter fan, uh, I've got a sure. bid for a Vince Carter rookie card on StockX right now, waiting for someone to accept. Um, basketball was a big part of it. I was also really into skateboarding. Um, the worst skateboarder you'll ever you'll ever meet, but love skate culture <laughs> and love mm-hmm. skate That's shoes. Me. <laughs> so um, you know, I was I was wearing a lot of Black Eye, a lot of DVS. Um, a lot of you know kind of globe sneakers um you know Rod- rodney mullen was big around then so when i was kind of a, when i was a teenager i was wearing a lot of skate shoes and a lot of and one to play basketball in um then when i got really more into kind of sneaker culture as we would kind of think of it it was really around i think the first pair was there was a Re- reebok reverse jam monopoly edition that they did in like oh, 2007 okay. 2008 or something like that that was um um, maybe it was long, even longer. That was a shoe that I was just like, that shoe's crazy. Um, and I bought it. And then I, I kind of went down the rabbit hole from there. And so um, I was really big into SBs in the 2000s, kind of out of skate and then into sneakers. And I kind of came to Jordans later in my sneaker journey um, as opposed to the beginning. So that was that, that speaks to some of it, if that makes any sense. So I don't know if there was one shoe, but and one Thai cheese. I just ordered the 2015 Bait. Um, and ones they've oh, seen the, okay, the, yeah. the 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 red and blue apple. I just uh-huh. bought a pair on StockX four days ago <laughs> um, for less for than, a good price for less than retail. Uh, oh, they're like eighty nine eighty nine euros or something like that. So I was yeah nice. Um, I was really excited, <laughs> really excited. So yeah, pretty obscure uh, obscure stuff. But SBs um, in in that era were also really big for me. What do you think about the um, latest hype around Nike SB? I, I absolutely love it. I mean, I think. Um, You know, you see the the how much over the last couple of years the old SBs have gone up, which is um, when I moved to Europe, I sold about 50 pairs of sneakers to help fund my move move to Italy, and um, it's the worst deal as anyone. I sold my uncles for like 450 Canadian dollars. Really? I oh, we have to I we sold. have to make sure. What what what's your size, by the way? <laughs> uh, yeah, um, 11 eleven US, so 10 UK. Oh, okay. <laughs> so was that forty forty five? So I. Yeah, I sold what the dunks for 700 Canadian dollars, and that's wow. I don't know, that's what 500 euro. Dead stock. These are dead stock Crazy. pairs. Um, you know, so <laughs> so some of those stuff like that. Um, so for me, the SBs coming back really hurts because I can't. You now it's too. These shoes are too expensive to buy back again. Yeah. So I've got to just kiss them goodbye. But I, what I like about SBs is that they were always a great canvas. Um, mm. That um, you know they were a really great canvas for. And really creative, and they were just the collaborations were with incredible people that were inspiring. Then, um, if you're into art or if you're into the music scene, you know my MF Dooms, the De La Souls. I um, mean, you know, those are two of my my absolute grails that I still have. I was a big cassette player fan, so her dunks, her blazers, 
you know, there was just a lot of fun and, and, and energy in the designs then. And then, you know, you could critique that, like, mo- like recent years of, like, where sneaker culture has been so mainstream and so hyped that some of the collaborations have gotten a bit safe or a bit too calculated. And what I like about this SB wave coming back is, it se- you know, they brought back, I think, the same creative director from the old era of SBs. And I think they're bringing back some of that fun um, playful design into the collaborations. So that makes me really excited. And I think the SBs that they're releasing are, are good quality shoes. So, so to get more into the detail, I must know, what do you think about the Ben and Jerry's SB dunk and the 7-Eleven, which were coming out because they are really loud. They're really playful. Like you said, that's something you like about Nike SB. Are these shoes you like too? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think as a collector, you like anything that's kind of playful. I don't, there's a difference between what you want to collect and like what you enjoy to buy in terms of like putting into the collection. I think so the SB speaks to so much nostalgia for me um, that the fact that it's playful and fun and even if it's pretty, pretty commercially branded, I'm, I'm totally cool with that. That doesn't mean they're the shoes that you can rock outside all the time, um, especially now that I'm, you know, it's not 2009. It's a bit of a different fit. Um But yeah, I, I, I guess I kind of look at them both ways. That's why I probably I wear Yeezys more than anything, but I don't really think of those as my collector's items. I think of those as comfy shoes that I wear. Um, whereas these SPs, I'm like, oh, those will go really cool next to these other insanely loud shoes in my collection, if that makes sense. I don't know. <laughs> you already said that the end one was the last item you purchased on StockX. Um, anything else you're really, really looking for? Are there many bits you've got out there or are you checking out StockX and the different items all day long? I have I have bids across the board on stuff and, and I'll just go okay. and plant low bids for things and just see if they catch because they do. Um, so I've, as I said, I've got, a, I've got a bid on a Vince Carter rookie card, basketball rookie card right now and the trading cards. That's... Um, that's really cool. I'm definitely going to buy that. I'm just holding, I'm just holding out on the price right now. That's a nice thing with bids is you put a bid out and you can say, Hey, like, you know, let it sit for a little while and, and see if yeah. someone takes it. I do sure. the same with lots of Diodoras. I've been trying to get all of the all gone Diodora, um, N9000 that he's done. I mean, they've done other silhouettes, but those are the N9000 are the ones that I, I like the most. Um, I got the 2007. I wore it when I was in Berlin last at um, fashion for Fashion Week. I spoke at Fashion Tech, and um, I had the 2007 All Gone Diodoras. You know, 250 pairs, dead stock. Came still with the still with the original store tag on them, and I got them for 129 euros. So I got them for like retail price, or maybe it was a bit more than that, but it was below retail or close to retail for a shoe from 13 years ago. So you just said what what was the last item or which items you are are buying on StockX. Um, Amadeus and I in our last or the episode before we talked about the little battle with eBay and of course other um, other competitors like Collect, Gold, Grail, whatever. Um, but what is the USP of StockX? What makes StockX so special in this competition? And why is StockX the number one worldwide? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is just down to our business model. I think, you know, I think that's really a key to so much of our growth and success. It's just like we didn't invent the stock market. The stock market's been around for hundreds of years, right? And it's an efficient way um, or one of the, you know, maybe the most efficient way we've come up with for people to trade. And and I think that's what um, what silences so much of the noise. And that's why it's, That's why our prices are so low because it's the efficient way for the market to dictate the value of that item. Um, and you get all sellers and buyers centralizing for around that product in the same place. So you don't have to go through hundreds of listings to find the best seller for something or to find the best price. You can just go to one product page and all of that information is there for you. And as we've grown, it just makes it easier and easier for people to do it. So whether you're a buyer or a seller, you know, there's no easier place to go and buy or sell the, these items um, just by the virtue of you can accept someone's money right now that's bid there. So if, you, if somebody listening has a 1998 Vince Carter rookie card 
um, that they want to sell, they can go. My credit cards, you know, call it, go out there right now. Um, or the Packer, you know, um, Diodoras, you can go to that page right now and you can accept my bid and it charges my credit card and you just sell it. So you don't have to worry about the hassle of scams and all that stuff. Um, I think that's part of it, right? Just that we've made it easier. And the reason it's easy is because we've, we're sitting in the middle to guarantee that transaction. We're investing constantly in the verification process to ensure that you don't have to worry about that other person. You just have to worry what you want to pay for that item or what you want to get paid for that item. And we try to take care of as much of the rest. So, um, that model is, is really just the, I think that the key to a lot of that success and, and look, you know, we, we, you know, we're, we can't, we were born out of sneaker culture. We, we know what the problems we're trying to solve. Cause I had to try to, you try to find a way to buy shoes from some guy in Japan when Atmos releases an exclusive there or Swagger releases an exclusive. You, it's, a, it's impossible. Now you just go on StockX and the shoes there. We've got an office in Japan, so we're already connected to those sellers. So, you know, um, and then our whole idea is that, you know, uh, be anonymous. You can just focus on yourself, focus on what you want. You have access to all these items in a way that has never been before. And it's easier than ever to transact that stuff. And we don't want to tell you what to buy. We want the the market to kind of dictate the action. So we put all of the, you know, the, the value for transparency on, on our product pages is really you know meaningful because we're not telling you what you should buy. We're telling you what every single person ever has paid for that item. And you decide what you want to bid on it versus, you know, and then you decide what you want to sell it for. And I think that, you know, our, 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 our pillars of that, I think are really what have been the key to unlocking what's so much different about, everyone else that guarantee for authenticity the guarantee that you know that the transparency of information and the ability to transact anonymously um, allows you to be trusting in the platform the ease of execution of your trades um, and just the you know I think the, the relationship and trust we build over time uh, lately StockX had a lot of things to cover you you had a data leak and many people were a bit upset about how StockX communicated the problem then you increased the buyer fee and had this little battle with ebay but most recently StockX had to quit people due to COVID 19 so um derek what are the challenges StockX has to face in regarding to in regards to the pandemic yeah look i think the challenges that we face as a company um um, are, are the same in this landscape as, as everyone else. Um, you know, I think overall, some of the things you talked about, you know, we, when I, I joined StockX two years ago and I was, I think, you know, uh, around 150, we had 150 employees or something like that by then. And, and, you know, you just look at the trajectory of the growth of this company. I mean, nobody expected it to be as big as it was, as fast as it was. And so we were always kind of catching up to our growth and, and things like, um, you know, the data incident that you have, that you talk to, I mean, a lot of those things just speak to the fact that we were trying to keep up with our with our growth as a business and then we continuing to invest in in improving the safety and security of that but you know we're really born out of the culture for the culture and i think that that's that's something that's really at the forefront of our mind and and we've always been trying to invest and be accountable to those things because we know that that those commitments to our users is ultimately what's going to maintain us as a business um, as we've grown um, you know the 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 way that businesses function um, is kind of really challenging. You know, you look at um, how you go from kind of growth at all costs to having to create more sustainable growth. Um, I think that's a, that's something that's been a real challenge for us to to navigate as a company in terms and and the, the the kind of COVID landscape is you know I think one of the one of the most important um, effects on that right is is the the entire climate goes if you can't survive as a business um then you know there's no um there's there's nothing else to su to support you so i think you know we've we've we're continued to try to op it offer the most um um you know the most the most dedicated service we can to our users and to um with that growth we have to invest in 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 the business as well to make sure that it's sustainable um and and you know i think that's that's where things like um um, the the fees that we've had to we've had to put into the marketplace are, are really not about profiteering. It's about really making sure that we're creating a, a sustainable company that allows us to continue to offer this. Um, and I think if you look at the the overall macro landscape for um, for businesses, especially in this era, you know that um, we're we're very fortunate to be in, in as relatively strong a position as we are um, um, to. To, to, to maintain maintain the way that we have and so you know we're we're, we're very 
Um, you know, we're very we're very fortunate in this digital era that that so much of the business is transferred to online. You know, our plights and, and the hardships that we've in, we've experienced as a company are, are very are very challenging for sure. And and you know, to go through that in any at any state is is is, is a is a difficult thing for business. But um, at the at the end of the day, we're very lucky that um, um, you know we're not in in some of the same same conditions as many other businesses who are having a, a relatively much much harder challenge with the way that this uh, crisis has affected um, the global economy. The, Derek, do you already see changes in the resale market or uh, in the customers' behavior or users' behavior of StockX due to COVID nineteen? You know, I think um, there's there's a there's a few a few different things. You know, I think the sneakers as a commodity are much more stable than what we've seen in, in global exchanges. So we haven't seen you know any significant reduction in in the value of products. If anything, you see some products skyrocketing in value due to Michael Jordan documentary and <laughs> other different kind of True. cultural factors. Yeah. So prices have held strong, but I think you know what you definitely are undeniable are. In countries like Germany, Italy, France, you know, just the effect of coronavirus on people's ability to leave the house or ability to go to work, these have an undeniable effect on um, how the marketplace can function and whether people can even sell or get shoes, right? Um, so, you know, on the on in terms of the the stability of the marketplace, you know, we've we've had to navigate um, all these. <clears throat> um, You know the impact in our in our in our respective regions where our where we operate to uh, make sure we comply with government um, government um, um, orders and 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 compliance measures to ensure that we're putting safety first and 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 operating in a healthy environment for for our team and for our customers. That's been um, something that's always fluid and continues to be fluid in in every region that we operate based on the nature of this crisis. Um, but but when we look at our customers, that's there's definitely been challenges for people to be able to just get shoes or get shoes to us that um, have been um, that have been different in Italy than you've experienced in Germany, even in different parts of Germany. So it's um, it's definitely something that's affecting the entire planet that in that, you know, anything in terms of physical form, we're certainly affected by. But what's interesting is to see, you know, that that the actual commodities themselves aren't uh, are more resilient in terms of price than than the the average stock market. So, um, you know, I think if we look at the you know, the 500 most popular shoes, I think is some 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 note that I had from January and February, and you look at the average prices over the last month versus the beginning of the year, and there's you know there's very little movement, less than four percent, or or some or the, or the price is actually um, the meridian price is actually higher. So I think that's really interesting. I, I've kind of joked with my with my wife that we shouldn't be buying gold bullion. Let's buy some sneakers and <laughs> you know, sit on some sit on some eighty five uh, Jordan ones and and um, ride out the ride out the crisis. So I, we say that in jest, but um, but you know really, I mean, when you look at the the, sh the stability of the commodity, um, I don't think it's crazy to say that like it might be another safe asset class to invest in at some point as it becomes more and more mainstream. People do it with wine. People do it with art. You see reports every month from some um, equity firm talking about how um, how strong these kinds of assets are performing as an investment class. And I think of sneakers as a you know piece of cultural um, consumption and and less so as an as an asset. But I do recognize the the potential there. Something which um, our community wanted to understand, and maybe you can put some light on it and and explain it, is that um, they don't really understand the luxury tax which will be added even when StockX already tried to um, to bring the European sellers together with the European buyers. Maybe you can yeah, so, explain it a little bit. So the luxury the luxury fee is something that um, we're we're it, for me is one of the biggest priorities for Europe for for sellers because um, we we put it there to ensure that we could allow people to continue selling those items if they wanted to and they could adjust their prices as accordingly that that fee is um, we is to is because we incur import costs in various parts of the world for where depending on where those those shoes go and we didn't have um, a way at the time and, and still don't of capturing those costs at the point of their their delivery and entry um, we're working on it to remove it but it was essentially the the, the fee was um, our way to continue to allow people to make the choice over whether they sell those items or not in Europe but we totally recognize and totally focus on 
getting rid of that fee in a, in a way that's sustainable for the business. And it's something that's one of my biggest priorities because we, we know that it just essentially makes it, um, um, in unfeasible or like uneconomical to sell those items on the platform. But it's really, it's never been about, um, capturing fees erroneously. It's been only about to kind of capture fees to ensure that we're covering the costs that we incur on those. It's very, it's not a, we don't profit at all from that, from that fee. But what we know that it does affect is people's trade velocity and volume in that price range. Um, so it's, uh, it's, we're not at a perfect point yet in terms of our experience in Europe because we're still building this as we go. And um, we've been really focused on how we retain a global marketplace because of the international nature of where products are released and, and, and put that we need to really ensure that we don't cut that off. And that's unprecedented. There's no marketplace that does that. And so um, we're we're having to solve problems in e-commerce that have never existed before, um, which is uh, exciting and inspiring, but it also creates these kind of barriers. But, you know, if I look back to where we've come in a year and a half and um, the improvements we've made so far in terms of starting at a place where if you bought something on StockX, you know, a year and a half ago, it was, and you're paying 30 US dollars in shipping, you were only able to transact in US dollars. Mm. Um, yeah, and right. the, you were having to pay your customs and duties at the door um, when, it, when it arrived to you, to where we've got to now to try to factor in this global marketplace. So um, it's not perfect yet, but it's certainly the, everything that are the pain points for our customers are the biggest priorities for us. And, and there's there's nothing more uh, a priority for me than for us to to get the full solve there. And I, I can't say too much more specifically about it, but um, <laughs> I'm... Um, I'm hoping it's uh, it's it's very much uh, in the near future that we'll have that we'll have that fixed. Okay, maybe one thing you can explain as well is the idea of um, letting people know how the StockX market in Europe is located. So you're sitting in London, and then you got an authentication center in uh, in the Netherlands, but sometimes they have to ship things in the US. Maybe you can explain that as well. Sure. So we we have um, um, we have an authentication center in in London, um, and this is where our kind of European headquarters office is. Uh, this is where we started. The office started in my 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 office when it was just me, um, <laughs> oh, which is you know which is perfect. <laughs> me and me and, easy. me and me and coffee shops running around talking to sellers, um, and then we we expanded. We opened an authentication center there. We have our our, our London office, um, and then last year we opened a verification center in. Um, in the Netherlands. Um, so now the, the idea for that was we always intended to have, um, have two in Europe um, because just the freight coming from various parts of continental Europe is much, uh, much cheaper to go to, to the Netherlands than to go to, to UK, for example. Right. So that's the, uh, we always want to get our authentication services as close to our sellers as possible because that allows us to get the items faster to verify them before we send them to the buyer faster and allows us to then pay out our sellers faster as soon as we verify the item. So, um, th those are, those are the two there. And then we have, um, um, globally, we have you know a number of facilities in the U.S. We have a, an office in Japan, um, and um, um, yeah, those are that's kind of where our geographic spread is. We have a small team in in Canada now as well. Sounds good. <laughs> Preparing for the future, right? <laughs> Moving back to Canada, there's now an <laughs> yeah, office. No, no uh, Europe is definitely definitely home. But um, yeah, that's where and, you know we have. Um, um, We're really trying to make sure that we're getting in, into the markets and improving our kind of local expertise. So we have, um, you know, Amadeus, I know you know Lena, who's our um, German marketing manager, and, and so making sure that we're able to kind of start to deliver more, not only in terms of resolving the mechanics like fees and things like that for market, but also for language and trying to make sure that we're as, um, improving the experience as much as possible um, across Europe as we, again, really try to make this as, glo as global as possible as, as we know sneaker culture is, is global. For for really for your personal personal side, do you think sometimes it's unfair how much shit and shit storms Stock X gets? Um, in terms of just like you know, like like sneaker, the sneaker internet is undefeated. Man, trolls are going to troll. <laughs> That's um, right. <laughs> look, I think we um, know what you're talking about. <laughs> look, I I think you know, I think you have to. Our motivation and my motivation for when I go to work is that look, I. I'm constantly trying to think of how can we improve this for the community and for the culture to offer something better. And, you know, we're, we've, we've, we're having to build it. I mean, we're only, we think about it. We're as a company. We're, we're four years old. 
um, you know, we've been in live in Europe for 18 months. And I think, um, you know, we, we, we know that we need to, we, we are our biggest critics. We're, we're, we're focused on things we need to improve and, and we want to make sure that we're accountable to, to users. I think more people, as we see from our growth, um, like us than don't like us. Um, and I think that, um, you know, some people, some people just like to be trolls and some people have, you know, difficult experiences that we really, that I take very earnestly. I, I go through forums. I go through my, my Instagram. People send me DMs about issues that they're having or, 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 you know, feedback that they, things that they've, they've, that have gone really well. So we don't try to dismiss it as haters going to hate. I think that, you know, there's, there's some, um, there's a lot of people that have genuine issues that need to solve and we need to, we are continuing to try to invest in finding ways to, to serve them and to solve those and ma- and make things better. But, you know, I think, you know, look at the, when, when we, when StockX came out, if you were a reseller before StockX, you were able to sell shoes for a lot more money than you could now. But I think now what we've done is we've, we we provide a, a service to sellers, but we've also democratized it for buyers, and I think that's what's led to our success. So I think a lot of people resent SuckX for they say killing the market, or uh, uh, but we're not we don't control the market. We help facilitate the market, and we reflect what the consumer demands. And 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 so the prices aren't set by us; prices are set by buyers. Prices are set by buyers and by sellers. True. And yeah, that's you, right. If you can't agree on a price, then the trade doesn't happen. But if yeah, you, can, got, you can use it or you don't use it, it's up to and you. So you know, I think um, I don't want to say that um, you know um, it, the the haters don't matter because I think it, it you know we we need to and we really are committed to listening to people. I'm you know I'm that's how I started this in Europe is I just went out and I took people who used the platform and I took them for coffee and I just asked them what needed to be better and what 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 worked and what didn't. And that's how we built all of the features to improve it. And that's how we continue to build the features for sellers and for buyers. And, and, um, so I, yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I, I think, uh, the squeaky wheel, you know, the, the trolls are sometimes the loudest, right? The vocal minority sometimes Mm -hmm. that, um, they get a lot of the attention, but you know, I, I think, um, we, we challenge ourselves to rise to what we know we have to do. And, um, you know, I, I, I think, uh, I think the net is, you know, um, you know the, the the net is is that it doesn't you know we we see we see the growth we know we're continuing to invest in and we we continue to see the the rewards of those the those efforts but you know we don't we're not going to sit here and say that we're we, we've got it all perfected but we you know we think we're we know that we're committed to to improving and delivering that and taking all feedback on board when it's constructive but you know i i, I tell you what though i laugh so hard some of the you know sneaker sneaker internet is undefeated man there's <laughs> there's some and sometimes it's just funny I mean, sometimes it's just funny but if you look at you know what we've you know what we continue to do i think we're having we're having much more positive impact than than a negative and you know look at charity campaigns and things that we do with that and the people we get to work with um you know i'm 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 not i'm not i'm not too phased um but uh, if anything i've seen in europe more people championing and saying the opposite saying what are you talking about like i use StockX every day i got paid out in 24 hours or you know my shoes came i got my court purples faster from StockX than i got them from nike and, um you know we <laughs> we want to continue to improve those things and and um um you know we're 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 proud when we deliver on it and we we challenge ourselves to to rise to the things we need to do better so um yeah it's a it's it's a you know sneaker in there that's funny man you already said that the kind of charity events you did over the last years, and we record this interview right in the middle of your support of the World Health Organization. Um, please tell us something about this specific charity event. Yeah, I think one of the things that we've, we've it's really exciting about StockX is, is that we have such an amazing community. We have such an amazing culture um, globally. That you know we're we're constantly trying to think of you know how do we harness the energy of our community to affect uh, things in a positive way whether it's a cause or um, you know how can we how can we use our our marketplace um, for for positive impacts and so you know we the the biggest one of the biggest ones we did in the past was the first one we did with Eminem for his hurricane relief efforts in 2017 that raised almost half a million dollars um, working with a bunch of different celebrities recently we did the Colette. Uh, charity campaign with Sarah Andelman. Yeah, and I didn't win. <laughs> Sorry, man. What, what was going on there? <laughs> I didn't win either, sadly. That's okay, one of my that's, absolute that's fair. grails. <laughs> then it's fair. 
<laughs> one of my absolute grails. Um, I've held the shoe, and I don't, I don't get to oh, keep it. I, I love that this this John one uh, storm blue with a Colette, and I really like Colette as a store and, and the impact which had it on on the whole um, on the whole scene and the industry as well. 100%. And that this shoe are oh, so great. We could do. I mean, if you want to do a Colette podcast episode? I'd be very happy to come back and just talk about how amazing we should that, do that. that business was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so with you know, for thirty pairs of, of Sarah Andelman's um, friends and family Jordan One, we raised you know almost two hundred thousand euros um, for for Oceana. And so with the with the you know the the current global crisis that we're in, we we definitely wanted to try to find a way to um, contribute to the fight against it. And so we we um, we were able to you know. Speak to our entire kind of our, our network of um, of collaborators and partners, people like Sarah Andelman, um, you know, people like Eminem. He's put put up uh, Jordan for Carhartt, um, Eminem fam- friends and family. He's donated that. Um, in Germany, Hickman was able to put an unreleased sample pair of um, of, of one of his sonar shoes. Kelvin Colt put a, a, a number of pairs from his personal collection, as well as one of the outfits from one, uh, that he wore in one of his music videos. And you know, I think it was just really trying to get our our network and our friends and family of StockX to find a way to use our community to do some good. So it was people bringing out their own items from their collection to donate, um, and and then you know people could go and bid. I think it's 10 or 11 euros or something like that per ticket to be answered to any one of these items that they want. And there's an incredible selection of, of prizes from Messi's boots that he's worn in match to the M&M stuff I've talked about, Sarah Andelman, Futura. I mean, it's just an incredible number of collaborators. This, and this, as Sean, of right now, this Sean Carter Reebok that signed yeah. by Jay-Z himself. How crazy <laughs> yeah. is that? And and what I said, in, uh, what I see in the list was um, the uh, uh, gold ring from Trin- Trinidad James. Shout out. <laughs> Yeah. crazy <laughs> it's it, it's a it's a wild oh, mix of people who've contributed you know basketball teams yeah. you know wolford zaha hey, kobe um, jersey and, as well right yeah it's um it's amazing so so far you know i think we're what two days into the campaign hmm. um you know we've raised over two hundred thousand dollars in like the last two Great. days already and so you know it's just again i just that speaks to the for me that speaks to the power of the community and again we're we're facilitating that it's the but it's the it's the community that's really doing it. It's the community of the creators that are um, that trust us to take their own personal collections to the market to help energize our community for for a good cause. And so, you know, that's a really big something that you know I'm personally I'm really proud to be a part of and and um, have have been. You know, we've we'll, we've we'll raised over you know a million you know almost we've we'll raised over you know almost half a million euros this year in the last twelve months just in Europe. Um, or just since I've been since I've been with the company in Europe, and great so achievement. You know, I, I think that that's um, it. Just speaks to the power of the community uh, as much as us. Again, we're just facilitating it and, and trying to harness that energy to have a positive impact. And w- you'll see more charity campaigns in the future as we continue to try to find ways to do this. And um, um, but it, it, it's um, it's really exciting to be a part of. And this is a pretty this is a pretty cool one for obviously meaningful cause. So this the the proceeds are going to. Um, you know the United Nations uh, um, um, coronavirus support fund. Um, you know, in the in for a lot of personal protective equipment and things like that for for people on the front line. So, um, very much a global um, a global initiative. StockX is a young company, uh, four years old in Europe since two years. You said it's a work in progress. You're working on uh, a lot of things right now to to make the progress. Um, you're a charity company as well. You're doing charity and raising money, fundraising money, 500k in Europe in the past 12 months. So, what's next? What are the next steps? You are. What are your next goals? What are you trying to achieve? Sure. I mean, you know, we talk a lot about Europe. I think um, we're really proud of where we've come and what we've been able to do in terms of delivering improvements Absolutely. to the market in, in so far, especially in Europe. Um, but as we talked about, we're not finished yet. We want to still continue to find ways to improve the experience, make it more relevant locally, make sure that it, we're able to be as um, um, uh, offer as good a service as we possibly can to all of our users, whether they're buyers or sellers, um, especially in Europe. That's where I, I focus most of my energy. And so there's a lot of things we need to improve in that. We talked about the luxury fee. We've talked there's you know other other things to optimize to help us connect there. Um, you know IPOs. We want to continue to evolve this and continue to work with brands and creators and bring their products directly to market. Uh, and I think there's a lot of different ways we can do that. Um, and I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of ways we, we, you'll see that that come to life. 
Um, you know, so in, it will continue to expand internationally as we want to continue to try to find ways to um, reach people in their own markets. Um, you know, this is a truly global culture and, and you'll see that continue to happen. As I mentioned, you know, we've got a small team in Canada and um, we're going to continue to try to find ways to to go there. And, and, and again, it just I guess the, the biggest thing is just continuing to listen to our customers and and speak out a final like what. What are the issues that they have and what are the things that they would like to see on the platform and, and what are the improvements that they need? And um, there's a lot of some of this very technical in terms of whether it's relating to payments or all kinds of different just functional aspects of the website and things that we need to build. Or um, And some things are, are much bigger about how we curate product and how we help people discover them when they're browsing on the platform. So it's 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 everything. And we're, we're constantly evaluating every corner of the business to find out how we can improve and, and, and making sure we're listening to people's people set advice on, on things that they need. So it's, um, man, it's crazy to see how far we've come in such a short period of time, especially when I think of where we were in Europe when, um, when I started, yeah, um, right. but it's all, uh, it, it's, it's, it's inspiring, um, how much more opportunity there is to, to continue to invest in, in, in these markets and, um, knowing how, how, you know, how much low hanging fruit there is and things that we can continue to improve. So it's, um, the work's never done. The work is definitely never done. <laughs> I guess so. One last question from my side. Uh, are all these fruits you're trying to pick um, fully digital or are there any plans to move to brick and mortar, for example? So you want to get close to the customer. I guess you can get the closest you can get to the customer by his smartphone. So you're, you're, you're absolutely in touch with the customer. But to get hyper local and to get to get all the fruits you you'd like to pick is are there any ideas or any plans or will it stay digital yeah so um, we have a facility we have a, a retail space in new york and we've we had a pop-up that we've had for an extended for a number of months in in london obviously this is all before you know coronavirus and, and covid19 happened um because that's obviously changed and going to change the way that bricks and mortar retail functions you know, maybe forever. Absolutely. Um, so, but up until then, you know, we had been um, running a drop off in London with, um, with also some other kind of different workshops and, and cultural programming that we were doing in there. And, and that's something that we want to continue to um, continue to assess and, and see how StockX can exist in real life, because it's also, you know, we're, we're conscious of, you know, and then, you know, that's why it's great when we connect with you guys, whether it's there or here on this, on this call, you know, we want to, We're, we're, we're a bunch of, you know, there's people like me, a bunch of people like me that are just sneakerheads that are you know happy to just wax and talk on, talk on sneakers. We're not some faceless, um, digital business out there. We're a bunch of, you know, there's, um, um, and so I think it's nice to just kind of connect with people and wax on it and show them that, that, you know, we are, we, we, that we get it a little bit. And, and, um, um, sometimes a retail location is, is, is a great forum to, to create, um, experiences that benefit our, our culture. And so um, we had a lot of great successes with our, with our facility in London that we, we closed only because of the pandemic. Um, and so when everything blows over, you know, it's hard to know what the world will look like then, but we'll continue to evaluate that. And, and when we're allowed to meet people in real life again, um, you know, you can, you can bet that that's something that we'll, we'll be considering. We, we did a big thing with Sarah Andelman last year in, in France, which is called stock exchange Paris, which, um, Uh, which was a lot of fun. And, you know, I think um, finding meaningful ways to create experiences in the communities that we operate in is something that, that's really important to us. It's just, um, you know, right now that's something beyond our control. Yeah, that's that's right. Hopefully we can meet each other all really soon again. And Derek, thanks for the deep dive into the whole history of StockX, especially for Europe. It was really, really interesting to, to get all this information and we're really looking forward to how uh, StockX will evolve and uh, develop the whole thing in the near future. And I guess this won't be the last time we talk to each other. So please let us know when there are new things coming up, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you bet. <laughs> You know, you, you got you got our you telephone numbers. Yeah, <laughs> just just drop a small message or whatever. Slide in our DMs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, um, wine. We got to get the wine. We got to get the wine show going. Yeah, true. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Derek, I pick a good bottle of Riesling. Speak to you soon, man. <laughs> yeah, Derek. Many thanks. Stay strong. Stay healthy. Hey, thanks, guys. You too. Bye bye. Stay healthy. Bye bye. Bye. Ja, das war äh, unser Interview mit Derek Morrison, dem Director von StockX in Europa. Ich äh, finde es sehr, sehr spannend, wie er 
durch den Wein nach Europa kam und es dann nach ein paar Jahren <lacht> zu StockX geschafft hat. Das ist auf hat. jeden Fall ein spannender Weg, das muss ich auch sagen. Und diese N- <lacht> und diese N1-Geschichte finde ich finde ich sehr sympathisch. Lieb ich, lieb ich. Und äh, wenn ihr wenn ihr nett seid und vielleicht nochmal bei euch im Regal bis im Keller nachschaut. Ähm, und äh, was hat er von Vince Carter gesucht? Die Rookie Card, ne? Ja, ja genau. Ähm, wenn ihr da noch was äh, irgendwo findet, äh, ich glaube, ihr würdet Derek zum glücklichsten Kind auf dem Kinderspielplatz machen. <lacht> äh, ganz großartig. Ich feiere es wirklich so, die Leidenschaft, die man ihm da anmerkt, was Reebok betrifft, was sein Interesse an, äh, fand ich mega, wusste ich gar nicht an, so überhaupt ähm, an Europa betrifft. Also Soulbox Collabs, A Few Collabs, die ganzen Diadoras, das ganze Euro Running ähm, Deck eigentlich so einmal durchdekliniert, ist ja auch nicht das Erste, was man erwartet von jemandem, der vor ein paar Jahren äh, um im Weinbau zu arbeiten aus Nordamerika rübergekommen ist. Finde ich mega spannend und dann natürlich auch, äh, ja, das, was er zu StockX selbst gesagt hat, ähm, finde ich ähm, eigentlich soweit auch verständlich. Du baust ein Business auf, das ist ein Business, was sich in einem stetigen Wandel betrifft, gerade wenn es erst vier Jahre alt ist und ich muss selbst sagen, ich habe selbst gegründet und das, was Benny und ich damals mit unserer Produktionsfirma in knapp drei Jahren aufgebaut haben, ist auch eben nicht mehr als eine Durchgangsstation gewesen. Entsprechend äh, finde ich auch seine Aussage zum Thema Luxury Fee ganz gut. Man versucht diese, diese Gebühren, die man eben hat vom Sprung aus den USA nach Europa in irgendeiner Form zu wandeln und umzubauen und auch schon direkt zu sagen, so, yo, das ist nicht das Ende der Fahnenstange, auch da wird weiter optimiert, finde ich, ist eigentlich eine ganz gute Aussage, mit der man dann auch arbeiten kann, dass sich das in Zukunft ähm, für uns auch hier noch weiterentwickelt und wir uns äh, mit dieser, oder dass die Luxury Fee, äh, dieses Prozent äh, nicht in Stein gemeißelt ist. Also ich fand es äh, ein sehr schönes Gespräch und am Ende dann natürlich noch zu hören, was äh, an wohltätigen Zwecken alles äh, auf einmal äh, auf diese Plattform gezogen werden kann, mit was für Unterschriften. Ich habe nochmal geguckt, so ein S. Carter in Deadstock mm. kriegt man in der Regel zwischen 50 und 80 äh, Euro nachgeworfen. Also ähm, ich sag mal so, ist jetzt nicht das beliebteste Modell, ähm, aber mit der Unterschrift von Jay-Z äh, hat das natürlich dann auch schon mal wieder einen ganz anderen Wert. Ne? Finde ich grandios. Ich finde das mega, dass sie solche Sachen überhaupt zusammengetragen bekommen. Also da merkt man auch einfach, was für einen Impact StockX hat und den Ausspruch zu sagen, hey, wir sind nicht perfekt, aber wir sind auch noch ein junges Unternehmen und dass StockX natürlich auch kein Unternehmen ist, was sagt, so oh, Geld will ich jetzt nicht verdienen, äh, das dürfte ja wohl auch klar sein, aber ich finde es gut, dass Derek auf jeden Fall so reflektiert ist zu sagen, ey, es ist noch nicht alles perfekt, aber wir, wir fuchsen uns da rein und wir machen und tun und ähm, sehr spannend zu sehen, was für Pläne es da auf jeden Fall für die Zukunft gibt und wie man halt eben auch mit dem Feedback arbeitet, ne? also das zeichnet ja am Ende des Tages auch ein gutes Unternehmen aus, zu sagen, hey, wir hören auch auf das, was da draußen gesprochen wird, selbst wenn es vielleicht mal ein paar herrschere Töne hat und die sind ja auch in gewissem Maße bei vielen Dingen ja auch gar nicht unberechtigt gewesen, das darf man nicht vergessen. Ganz genau. Und das ist eben auch das, was jetzt dann am Ende zählt. Derek hat gesagt, dass das ein Work in Progress ist. Das ist schön, dass man da auch als Unternehmen ähm, dann auf diese Dinge exakt eingehen möchte. Ähm, ja, auf Worte müssen dann Taten folgen. Und dann werden wir in den nächsten Monaten und vielleicht auch Jahren natürlich dann die Augen offen halten, inwieweit sich genau das verändert. Es sind ja große Pläne genannt worden. Und da bin ich jetzt zumindest sehr gespannt. Und ich bin auch gespannt auf euer Feedback auf die äh, 55. Episode, insbesondere natürlich das Interview, was wir jetzt gerade hier mit Derek Morrison von StockX geführt haben. Wie sind eure Meinungen zu den einzelnen Themen, zu seiner Sammelleidenschaft, zu ähm, den Plänen mit StockX und natürlich auch, äh, wie viel Bock habt ihr auf diese Charity-Aktionen? Was wäre euer Favorit? Und zu guter Letzt natürlich, falls ihr eins der Produkte habt, das Derek angesprochen habt, lasst uns auch definitiv eine Nachricht da. Und damit vielen Dank, dass ihr bei der 55. Episode mit dabei wart. Ihr könnt alle Episoden wie gewohnt kostenlos auf Spotify, Apple Podcast, dieser Google Podcast, YouTube, Podigy und bei allen anderen Streamingdiensten hören. Und wir würden uns natürlich sehr freuen, wenn ihr Oshun dort abonniert, wo ihr Podcasts am liebsten hört. Schaut auch auf Facebook und Instagram.com slash Oshun Podcast vorbei und interagiert mit uns und der Community. Seid ein Teil. Sehr freuen wir uns auch über 5 Sterne und eine positive Bewertung bei Apple Podcasts. Ein Shoutout würden wir hier gerne mit euch teilen. Flipti schrieb vor einigen Wochen, den Zweien zuzuhören macht wirklich Spaß. Ich habe 
aber seit gut einem Jahr starkes Interesse an Sneakern und habe dazu noch den passenden Podcast gesucht, mit Oshun dann auch direkt ins Schwarze getroffen. Weiter so, Jungs. Dafür vielen Dank, Flippdi, das freut uns sehr und tut uns einen Gefallen und supportet den Podcast und erzählt mindestens einem Freund oder einer Freundin, die sich für Sneaker und Streetwear interessiert von uns. Show some love. Dankeschön und wir hören uns in der nächsten Episode wieder. Bis dahin. Macht's gut. Macht's gut, wir hören uns. Tschüss. Ciao, ciao. Oh Schuhen, der Sneaker-Podcast mit Simon Buß und Amadeus Thüner. Alle zwei Wochen auf iTunes, Spotify und YouTube.